I can just speak loud. Just open one. Mike is waiting. Γιώργο, μην τους πρέπει να ανοίξεις αυτό. Okay, it's going to be a bit of a challenge tonight, uh, whether uh, I wake you people up or you wake me up. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm not certain as to how much time I have to talk. The amount of material that we could go through uh, could last a long time, and I, I would, uh, <clears throat> one thing up front, this should be interactive. If you have any questions about what I'm talking about, feel free to ask. We can discuss various elements uh, about what uh, I'm going through. So uh, hopefully uh, it's just uh, <clears throat> we can talk and try and figure out and make sure it makes sense for both of us. Anyhow, I'm just going to get started. Uh, let's see. Which one of these things goes to the next one? One would have not. Okay, so it's up and down. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, you saw that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, likely go through two aspects tonight uh, basic meteorology, uh, try and understand uh, the, the uh, physics of what we're. Uh, and we're flying toy airplanes in the atmosphere, and so you need to understand the meteorology before you can really start to understand thermals. And then, okay, uh, how do you figure out where the thermals are? That's the air reading. Uh, the extra credit modules that we will not have time for. I, I have talks for model setup, competition strategy, practicing, etc. But we'll go through that. The, the basic lecture is blah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so, yeah, lots of talking. I appreciate if you guys have questions. Uh, so, first we'll just get into meteorology. Uh, what I'm going to cover, obviously, what drives what we do. It's solar radiation. The you know, sun heats the ground, uh, ground warms up, life is wonderful. Uh, we get thermals. Uh, a very important thing is... How high do the thermals go? Typically, there is a thermal inversion. It's just a matter of how high it is. And that changes during the day. Every day has a cycle. And there's bigger cycles above that. But no, no. we'll cover what an inversion is. Uh, and beneath the inversion is what they call a mixing layer. And then uh, there's a daily cycle where thermals start low and then go higher. So we'll go, go through that. And then local influences uh, you I guess uh, you guys uh, in Europe you call it uh, coastal conditions or continental conditions you know, I call it inland versus coastal uh, language issues uh, then uh, lapse rate and how it influences thermal formation uh, and of course wind and you know, just typical conditions and variations <coughs> This is a very simplistic uh, chart of what I call the playground. Uh, and, of course, thermals. 
what is a thermal? It's where the air gets warm. So <clears throat> look at temperature and then temperature versus altitude. If, uh, if you grab a piece of air and lift it up in altitude, it you know, pressure goes down so the, that that little parcel of air expands and when it expands it cools down. So <clears throat> there's this, uh, if you just grab a piece of air and carry it up in altitude, it cools down and uh, <clears throat> the, neglecting anything else, that rate of how it cools down is what they call the adiabatic lapse rate. If uh, normally the air has a little bit more, uh, 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 it, it doesn't quite cool down as fast as that parcel is, so it would be slightly stable lapse rate. If, if there is uh, uh, the air colder with altitude, what happens is you, you grab a piece of air near the ground, you lift it, and all of a sudden it's warmer than the air around it, so it just wants to go faster. Uh, that creates things like thunderstorms. So <clears throat> that's an unstable lapse rate. Uh, and then as you get up, up to a certain altitude, there will be uh, where the temperature doesn't get cooler with altitude, and that uh, produces a ceiling on what, how high thermals go. And that's what we call the inversion height or the top of the mixing layer. And the thermals play in that uh, area below that ceiling. There's, there's some terminology in there that people usually have questions on, so feel free to ask if you want to ask. Oops, wrong direction. <coughs> As uh, <coughs> things change from early morning where the air is very stable and sometimes you have uh, a very low level inversion and then you get the first thermals and then the late morning where you're mixing from the uh, low altitude stuff. And so I'll, I'll go through the uh, typical daily cycle uh, that, that occurs. Early morning, okay, yes, you have a higher level inversion. And then there's, uh, <clears throat> well, you, you've seen it out there in a, you know, when you're out in the flats and there'll be like ground fog. And, you know, it's really cold on the ground. If you drive up a hill nearby, the air actually gets warmer as you go up with altitude. So it's very, very stable. There's no vertical mixing. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this chart shows, uh, okay, uh, early morning, the air is actually <clears throat> coldest right on the ground. And as you go up in altitude, it actually gets warmer. So no thermals. The air is just flat. And then what happens when the sun starts coming in, the ground starts warming up, and then you, you get the, to where you get a low level uh, inversion, and the warmer it gets, the, uh, or as the day gets longer, that, that low level inversion increases. And what happens there uh, is you get little thermals that might go up. I mean, first thing in the morning, the thermals can be only 30 meters high. They, they go up and hit the ceiling and stop. And then, oh, something, something. Uh, and uh, a, a second aspect of this is cool. Don't touch anything. Uh, one, one of the corollaries is uh, the thermal size is correlated with the inversion height. So the inversion height is quite high, the thermals are very big, and then the thermal spacing tends to be correlated with the inversion height. So early, you know, early morning when the inversion height is low, <coughs> that the thermals are very close together, and in fact you could have eight, ten thermals in the field. It's great for hand launch because you can throw the airplane up and I can pick this one, I can pick that one, I can pick that one. So early morning, lots of thermals, but you don't get very high. And then late morning, <clears throat> as uh, things continue, oops, I remember down here. Uh, <clears throat> late morning, <clears throat> the thermals are beginning to get more vigorous. The, uh, the temperature is warming up, but you still haven't broken through to the, uh, the higher part. So the thermals are beginning to get bigger. <clears throat> and then you're approaching what they call uh, full-scale uh, sailplanes would call a trigger temperature where you're getting to where you've made it to the uh, <clears throat> where you get the full mixing 
And the fun part is the transition from uh, that morning to the afternoon. <clears throat> the character changes when you burn through the low-level inversion. <clears throat> and sometimes, as you guys uh, found out at the uh, F5J European Championships, it might be windy above the mo morning low-level inversion. So morning you got little thermals and so on, and then as you burn through to the higher level, uh, all the wind from above comes through and bam, you've got wind, and the rules change. So for me, I, 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 I try and understand when the rules change. So early morning the rules are little thermals, light, uh, you know, low ceilings, and then uh, once you get to the trigger temperature, you, the rules change, big thermals, far apart, lots of sync between them. <clears throat> so you have to understand what, you know, you know, what rules apply at what time. And then, of course, midday, you get to <clears throat> uh, very active air. In fact, low level, the air can be quite unstable. Yeah, try that rotation. That might work. <clears throat> and uh, uh, especially like uh, I think we saw it yesterday uh, for a little while when it was uh, fully sunny, uh, midday, you get to what I call the boiling water pot uh, at low level where you get these thermals, uh, very strong low level thermals that go for a little bit and then they explode. And so, very, <clears throat> and then finally uh, a few of those will coalesce and you get the big thermal. You know, when the field, everything's going up, but in between you get these little pop, 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 where the, the, low, the low level thermals uh, might only exist for one minute, minute and a half, you get four or five turns, and then poof, where'd it go? It's only sink. <clears throat> and uh, that's, that's in that unstable uh, layer near the ground. But once you get to the, you know, you find where, <clears throat> uh, where the big thermal is, uh, that's half the field is going up, and that's the, you know, the big thing, and then there's, it might be a mile or two miles until the next big thermal. And in between is just the little bits that, uh, don't don't uh, stay together pretty well. Well, and normally uh, <clears throat> during the midday, the inversion height is well above what we can fly with our model sailplanes. Uh, so, uh, but if you're near the coast, sometimes uh, you know, if you have an ocean influence, the inversion layer might be only a thousand feet up. So. At that time, uh, the annoying part is as you're in a thermal and you're getting close to the top of the inversion layer, uh, at <coughs> near the ground, uh, the thermal pulls air in and it goes up and it, then it hits the ceiling and spreads out. So when you're near the top of the inversion, you, know, you come up and it just pushes you away and it's very hard to stay on top of that uh, column of air. <coughs> and the closer you get to the top of the inversion, the harder it is to stay in the thermal. And, <clears throat> for those of us that use the uh, rule that the, you know, the air gets sucked into a thermal, at, when you're near the top of the inversion layer, the rules reverse. The air always pushes you away from the thermal. So uh, what we normally think of as the third vector for near the ground always takes you to sink when you're near the top of the inversion layer. Direction. <clears throat> as it starts... You know, late in the afternoon and the sun's getting low, <clears throat> the, the thermals get a little bit more soft, and but they're well organized. There's none of that little pop, pop, pop thing. It's, you know, the air is very well organized, but near the ground, the air is, the, the thermals are very weak and they only are strong at reasonable altitudes. The, the inversion height is at its maximum for the day. And, before things start cooling off. And sometimes, even before sunset, you'll uh, get uh, the start of a inversion layer near the ground. The classic example I remember of that was one contest uh, near Istanbul where we're doing evening flights. And on the ground, <clears throat> we're still finding some thermals at altitude, but on the ground is ground fog. So it's shut off at the ground. So you're still getting mixing at altitude, but near the ground, nothing. And then 
in the evening conditions, the thermals are very soft. It's almost just, it just, <clears throat> the, the air is just moving because it was moving. There's not much uh, thermal activity helping out anymore. And uh, uh, then you start getting into uh, <clears throat> uh, so some of the things I'll talk about later, like over uh, a woods or trees that have stored up energy, they'll release it in the evening. But uh, So that's the only place you'll find thermals, but near the ground, we're done. Now I'll uh, start talking about uh, uh, <clears throat> geography. I, we, we saw some great examples of uh, uh, today of just how helpful a tree line is <clears throat> in terms of getting that air that's come across that nice warm uh, cotton field and, but it needs something to help it kick off and it goes downwind and hits the tree line and pop, okay, I got something to work. And if you take the thermal too far downwind behind the tree line, the air is just kind of run out. So you come back to the tree line and it's, it's truly not exactly slope. It's the, those trees are helping to kick the air off and talk about the various bits and pieces. I won't go through it here. So. <clears throat> now, the, the classic thing we were doing for a while today is using that tree line to help that air get kicked off. Because the air is actually warm enough to start, but the, until something uh, helps it to break free, it just moves, moves along the ground. So use uh, uh, tree lines, buildings, etc. And I'm pretty sure most of you people are quite familiar. I'm going to learn how to use the right button soon. <clears throat> and then, of course, I uh, mentioned like the, in the, uh, the forest, uh, if you've ever gone for uh, a hike in the forest and in, in the late evening, you, know, you, you walk through an open field, it's cold, and you walk in the forest, it feels nice and warm. That forest stores heat. But the, the, the annoying part is, <clears throat> and early morning or late morning, you walk into the open field and it's nice and warm. You walk into the forest, it's cold. So forests are you know, very poor for thermals early morning, late morning, even to mid-afternoon. Late evening when everything, the open areas are cooling down, that's when the forest uh, gives up all the heat. Of course, we know your normal lake <coughs> is a sinkhole. Uh, one thing that, uh, that you, whenever I go to a new field, the first thing I do when I'm driving in is look around, try and understand what are all the possible locations. Uh, where is it plowed? Where is, where, what fields are being irrigated? So I have a better understanding of you know, where am I most likely to look for thermals. And so, you know, a watered green field, Unlikely. Uh, a fre you know, freshly plowed field with the brown dirt that's nice and dry, heats up easily, gives gives up heat. Of course, urban environments, nice, you know, as asphalt parking lot. We like those things, especially when there's a building just downwind of it to kick that heat off. So <clears throat> always look at the, the terrain. Uh, you guys in Europe have some interesting sites where this is a uh, 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 definition of anabatic and catabatic. Uh, in, the, <clears throat> in the evening, the mountains cool down, and then you get cool air flowing down the mountainside and filling in the valleys. So you'll have uh, the cool air coming down the mountainside and then going into the valley. And you can fly in the middle of the valley, and it's just like everything's just going up very, very slowly, and you can't find a, a, any center of lift. It's just everything's going up slowly, and near the mountains, it's going down. And in the morning, it's the opposite. The, the sun comes in and heats up the mountainside, and then you get this sheet of air going up the mountainside. Growing up in Los Angeles with the smog, I remember being up in the San Gabriel Mountains with my RC sailplane in the 70s, and 
that I'm standing above the height of the smog layer in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles has smog, so you're seeing this gray, brown, ugly stuff you know, below you. And then you look at the side of the mountain, and there's this sheet of smog going up the mountain that's like three, 400 feet thick. So yeah, come, the mountainside warms it up and just it runs up the side of the mountain. So that's, that's anabatic flow. So where the mountain gets warmer, and the air runs up the mountainside. And there's lots of little words beneath, so you can read that. I don't need to read it for you. And obviously, the sun's providing the source for our thermals. Uh, you know, how high the sun is, wintertime, the sun's low to the horizon, so you don't get much energy. Uh, <clears throat> yesterday and today, when we have high clouds, it's filtering that energy coming down. And, you know, okay, the... <clears throat> It's, you know, all of a sudden the sun comes out and it takes a while for it to warm the ground up and the ground warms the air up and all of a sudden we got bubbles. So it's, it's uh, when the sun first pops out, it's not like instant thermals. You know, the thermals slowly get going, they wake up, they have, their, they have their morning coffee and then 15 minutes later, huh, we have thermals. And then similarly, when, <clears throat> when the clouds come over, it's not like instant shut off. It takes a little while, you know, the thermals are getting a little tired, you know, okay, time for their afternoon nap, and so there's, there's a bit of lag time. There's, uh, you know, the engineer in me says there, there can be significant phase lag between the appearance and disappearance of the sun and uh, <clears throat> uh, when the thermals start and stop. Uh, and you can use that, especially when it's puffy clouds and so on, you look around and okay there's little cumulus clouds and you see the shadow on the ground and then the, no, this this field gets sun that's that field gets shade don't think of it as oh that field just got sun there's going to be a thermal over there that field's had sun for 15 minutes maybe that field will finally start generating a thermal so you you, you have to integrate what has happened over the last 10 or 15 minutes for where the sun has been and will be to understand <clears throat> uh, likelihood for uh, thermal generation. Uh, another one, and we've seen mild variations of it uh, both yesterday and today on uh, when you get an air mass moving in and then uh, <clears throat> uh, that air mass that moves in, uh, typically it's a little bit cooler air that comes in and then wedges in underneath the existing air mass and you get this area in front of the wind shift that lots of lift and then <clears throat> immediately after that cool air moves in you, uh, you get a very stable lapse rate and you get uh, a period of time where the lift is uh, not friendly. <clears throat> but so. We get that a lot in New Zealand where I fly because we're quite close to the uh, ocean. And uh, the morning conditions, it's offshore flow, uh, catabatic flow going out to sea. And then the ground warms up and then uh, finally the, the ground, uh, the air inland is much warmer than the air over the ocean and it pulls the air in from the ocean. And uh, <clears throat> for that 15 or 20 minutes from the, when the wind switches, uh, you know, everyone's a winner. There's a thermal everywhere. You, know, you, you, you feel like you're the best thermal pilot in the world. And then the wind comes in and you find out you aren't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm going to talk about you know, how do I figure, you know, I've given you some of the basics on the uh, uh, field and so on. Uh, now we're going to talk about how do you figure out where the air is. Uh, I feel a bit silly because some of you guys in here are very good at this. So <clears throat> uh, I'll just give you some of my perspectives on it and uh, uh, what I look at. And feel free, feel free to teach me because uh, some of you guys are very good at it as well. <clears throat> you know what a thermal is. It's air that's lighter than the surrounding air. I will make a caveat on that. Sometimes it's not warmer than the surrounding air. It might be more humid than the surrounding air. Uh, that shows up uh, sometimes like it, after it's been raining. 
and okay, over there it's a little bit more humid and it, it actually will release and make a soft thermal. But mostly it is lighter, it is warmer than the surrounding air. Uh, the thermal shapes people talk about, you know, this torus shaped thermal, a donut shaped thermal thing. Really? <laughs> Those things don't exist except in very rare circumstances. Now, a thermal might be a column. It might be just this little bubbly thing that just released and left where you, uh, if you catch it in the right place, uh, you're, you're happy and uh, then it just, you know, there's not much underneath it. But most of the time, thermals are not very well organized. Uh, they're very chaotic in nature. Uh, there's some been, been some interesting studies using a laser radar in uh, the U.S. where they use a laser and it just gets returned from particles in the atmosphere. I mean, it's, it's U.S. There's smog. Come on, there's lots of particles up there. <clears throat> so they, they can uh, get a laser return and they get the, the velocity from the uh, frequency Doppler effect from zapping these particles. So they get the velocity map of the atmosphere. And uh, it's not organized. Now, what we think of is this nice, perfectly circular thermal. No. no it's in here, there, whatever. <clears throat> uh, when there's wind, the thermals can organize in a line roughly upwind and downwind. Uh, and then uh, not you can call it a thermal street, and then the next one is when there's more wind than okay. Even in light winds, if there's a lot of high level high clouds, so there's not much sun on the ground, that the the lift can become more shear dominated, where and that you get the, the thermals to organize in in the rows, and I, I call that corridor soaring. Uh, it's not quite thermal streets, but you can you know, launch into the wind, you poke into the wind, and okay, you feel a little pull to one side, and you slide over and tink, tink, tink. Some people will circle, and they fall out the backside. You know, or you can just surf it. So you can surf in a corridor, and those corridors might last two, three minutes, and then they, they fall apart. But <clears throat> understanding when to work it as a classic, you know, a uh, thermal column versus a corridor is quite the art. Yeah. <clears throat> I've covered uh, most of this, uh, but you know, when the ground is really wet, the sun beating on the ground, mostly what it does is evaporate the water rather than heat the air. So, uh, again, you look for dry ground as uh, something that kicks the thermals off. Uh, so. Uh, ground moisture, air humidity, when the air is really humid, it, it's, uh, it just seems like the, uh, the sun energy doesn't go into making thermals as well, so you get much softer things. Uh, the lapse rate, uh, when there's a high pressure system, the, the lapse rate is more stable, so the thermals become more weaker and diffuse and covered in inversion height and cloudiness. Okay, now we're going to get to classic, base, basic thermal 101. Thermals, they feed from warm air near the ground. Sun warms up the ground, the ground warms up the air. <clears throat> uh, thermals, they drift with the wind. Uh, <clears throat> they're, not, they're not attached to the ground somewhere. They, they drift along with the wind. Uh, when you get two thermals that start off near each other, they tend to want to merge together. So <clears throat> thermals are attracted to each other and they mate. Yes, and they make big thermals. <clears throat> and then uh, the thermal aspect ratio. In the big picture, uh, uh, if the inversion height is 1,000 meters, uh, the thermal width will be 300 to 500 meters in the middle. Uh, near the ground, it's lots of little things that coalesce to make the big thermal. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, near the ground, the thermal is like a vacuum cleaner. It's sucking the air into it. Uh, near the top, it's hitting the uh, ceiling and spreading out. Uh, 
one of the annoying things is if you get into that brand new thermal, it's pushing into the air above, and the air above is just there, so it comes up and spreads out. You, you've all seen time lapses of a cumulus crowd, cloud growing. It spreads out, so you're in that piece of air in the thermal, and it's just going up, and it pushes out, and all of a sudden you're in the waterfall, you're in the sink. You know? So, brand new thermal, as you go up, it it's hard to stay in the middle because it just keeps trying to push you out. And so a new thermal is hard to stay centered in as you climb up. Bottom arrow, always bottom arrow. <clears throat> okay. Uh, as I say, near the ground, thermals are pulling, uh, pull, you know, pulling in the air. And what you're looking for is how do I measure or feel or see a flag or even sometimes you can use your ears you can hear okay I hear wind in the tree I, that doesn't tell me wind vector but it tells me wind speed change so the, the trees upwind today oh I'm hearing the leaves rustling that means something just past the trees so that tells me that gives me an indication of, okay there's a thermal along the trees coming to me so you can use all kinds of things to tell you about uh, uh, the thermal inflow that you're getting pulled in. And then uh, the next thing is uh, the engineer and me started figuring out, okay, I feel the wind change. How does it point me to the thermal? And so you just do vector maths uh, and you get what I call the third vector. So if, if the wind is blowing straight towards you guys, uh, you know, me talking a lot, the air's going that way. <clears throat> the average wind's going that way, and then you feel the wind slow down and shift over a little bit. And how do you know what, you know, assume that it's a thermal that's caused that. So it's shifted over, so okay, the thermal's that way. It's slowed down, so it's somewhere in front. If you can draw the uh, vector of what you feel versus what the average is, the difference between those two points towards the thermal. <clears throat> there should be another chart in there. Okay. Yeah, this chart goes through the vector maths of what I'm talking about. So when you're, <clears throat> everything's going towards the thermal plus the a, a typical average wind and oh, different colors on the screen versus up there. Cool. So, <clears throat> uh, the blue is what you feel, the green is, uh, or the blue is average wind, assuming no lift, no sink. Uh, the green is what you feel, and the yellow is that thing that points towards the thermal. And so you have to, <clears throat> if you're a really good analyst, you can mechanically do this, or if, uh, eventually, uh, for me, it was intuitive, and then I figured out what my int intuition was doing. And so, okay, the engineer in me finally figured out this is what my intuition does to help me figure out what the ther where a thermal is. So you're using this for where you're standing. If you can do it and see what what's going on with the flag somewhere else, now you can start making a, a map of the field. <coughs> so. <clears throat> the more pieces of information you can use, flags here, tree over there, what I'm feeling here, what I see in the grass, you can make a map on the field of where the air is converging and where the air is diverging. Stay, aware from, stay away from the diverging areas. That's usually sink coming down, air spreading. Where the air is converging, that usually means the air is going up in the middle. So now I will actually use the up <clears throat> to... Now, okay, I've talked about various bits and pieces. There's lots of different things you can uh, uh, look at. Uh, the, the very first thing is you see somebody's airplane screaming up. That's a pretty good sign the air's going up there. That's a high priority sign. Uh, next one is uh, uh, not what I feel, but what the airplane says. I'm flying straight ahead and all of a sudden it's getting pulled to the left. That's usually a sign that it's getting sucked to a thermal. So that is my second highest priority. 
The third highest priority is what I am feeling or what I see in a flag. So, <clears throat> uh, and then fourth, if I don't if I don't see any of the number three, then I will go for what I call statistical. Okay, you know, pay, parking lot, tree line, etc., and uh, <clears throat> a, a, a ground obstruction like the tree line. And if I'm really low, uh, uh, the priority of using that ground obstruction starts increasing. So these are the priority of the various signs that I use. So, you, you, and and then the next one is, uh, you think of, okay, I might get two or three of these different things, and if they all add up together, we have a winner. And then, <clears throat> wind influence. You guys are a boring audience. Nobody's asked a single question. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm a boring speaker then. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, how does uh, wind influence things? Uh, <clears throat> wind influences how the air mixes and how the thermals organize. And uh, uh, <clears throat> if it's uh, uh, the sun is low to the horizon, then there's not much heating influence on the ground, and the wind can mix the air up so much that there's just not much thermal influence. The air gets mixed so much that the thermals don't really form. And when they do form, they form in the uh, corridors I've mentioned earlier. Uh, so you get the, the weak thermals, they, they, they're they not really consistent. Uh, when there's wind strength change with altitude, then the thermals can really get weird. Uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, in New Zealand, we have a lot of that because we're so close to the ocean. Uh, in fact, last weekend while I was flying, the wind, had, the onshore wind had come in, and below maybe 300 meters, the wind was blowing out of the east, and above 300 meters, the wind was blowing out of the west. So you catch a thermal and you go up, and then all of a sudden, and then <clears throat> the base of the thermal is over here, and that piece of air that you were in just, and then you, the massive sink, so you'd have to fly downwind to get back into the thermal and you go up and, and it was like two circles go, two circles go. So you have to understand the wind change with altitude as to how you stay into the thermal. And that's where, now that one was a classic, the upper thermal is getting sheared off and <clears throat> when that shearing happens that air starts organizing into those thermal corridors. One of the things that tends to happen is the upwind edge of the thermal sharp edge. You know, when you find when you fly upwind out of the thermal, it's like there, great, 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 bam. And downwind is typically a little bit softer, uh, where it, it's hard to figure out where the edge of, of the thermal is. Uh, 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 when uh, when there's wind, you get what I call convergence zones, which makes these thermal corridors. You get lift corridors. And you can see in the uh, schematic on the uh, bottom right, uh, that's, that's a cut perpendicular to the wind, uh, where you get this area that's going up, and then be between the corridors, the air is going down. It's usually not nearly as neat as that. Uh, it's much more messy. And again, chaotic. So you get these strings and corridors that shift around. So you feel it, feel it, feel it. Okay, move over. And as soon as things get ugly, shift crosswind until you find the next corridor. Uh, this is uh, very applicable, applicable for hand launch and moderately applicable for what we do uh, with F5J. Now you guys know how to thermal. <clears throat> so, I've talked about the drier ground and tree lines and hills. We won't get into that too much. This one's actually uh, very important for how high are you launching. The, if you've ever done evaluations, if you, if you launch straight above you, 
and okay, I'm just gonna do a medium launch straight above me. 200 meters, what do you mean? Or if you launch way out in the horizon. I, I got in trouble with that a couple times today where you know, I power out you know, 300 meters and think, oh yeah, that looks pretty high. And it comes back 82 meters. That's all I launched to? So really try a lot to uh, uh, retrain yourself so you understand uh, the <clears throat> difference between distance and altitude because the airplanes way out always look higher than they are and the airplane close in always looks lower than it is. And for the launching in F5J, that's really, really important to understand uh, the difference there. And the, the, the next part about that is when you're in a thermal that's coming up to overhead, you start thinking, oh, it must have dumped because now, now my airplane looks really low and really low. You stay with it and it goes down one a little bit farther and wow, it got high. So <clears throat> you don't give up on a the thermal because it looks bad when it's overhead. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> I've done well in many a contest where I just go, the air has to be there. Launch circle straight overhead. Everybody else goes you know, the four, four directions of the compass. No, they don't find it, and I'm just sitting here looking low overhead, and then all of a sudden my airplane's really high. So, <clears throat> understand the difference between perspective and uh, reality. There's lots of things that are not thermal lift. You have wave lift, which is actually somewhat rare for uh, us to be able to use, but it does happen. Uh, wave lift happens when the air is stable. They're uh, lapse rate is stable enough so if I pick up a piece of air near the ground it comes up and now it's colder than the air around it so it comes back down <clears throat> and so if I just <clears throat> had a balloon and I lifted it up high enough and so it, you know, the air in the balloon expanded and it was colder I let go and it, it comes back down and it'll actually drop down below and then bounce back up and down now <clears throat> what happens when it's uh, windy that balloon, I pick it up, it comes down and back up, then come down. And so when you look at it from the ground, that balloon does a wave action. <clears throat> that is precisely what happens when the air flows, flows over a mountain and comes down. On the backside of the mountain, now it <clears throat> wants to come back up to its stable height. And so the air bounces up and down just like a water in a river. It makes little waves. So that's wave soaring. You find where the air is going up on that, and up it goes. I talked a little bit about uh, uh, earlier when the air is moving in, uh, you know, a cooler air mass is coming in and wedging under that, that you call a shear line. Hydraulic wave, I've only <clears throat> truly had fun with this a couple of times. Uh, an example of this is Cal California flying uh, in a valley that uh, the during the day, the air is coming in the valley because it's warmer inland. Uh, and then eventually, in the evening, <clears throat> it starts cooling off inland, and that air just has inertia and keeps coming in. And finally, the air uh, inland uh, just it's not accepting it anymore. And all of a sudden, you get this boom. You get this <clears throat> hydraulic wave of uh, you know, the air stopped here, and it's coming in. It makes this little mashy thing. And, all of a sudden it's sending uh, waves up upwind. And uh, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen where <clears throat> I'm just flying along, the air's stable, there's no thermals around. And then, wow, that's going up. And then I shift around and I finally figured out that if I surf this wave upwind, I could go <clears throat> you know, until the airplane's hard to see, I come back and catch the next wave and surf it upwind. But if you try and circle it, you just come down. Weird, the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And <clears throat> Dynamic soaring. Now that's fun, but hard to do with an F5J airplane. <laughs> it has to be. Anyhow, it looks like I've gone through the entire thermal thing without a single question. You guys must be good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> any questions? Come on, somebody's got to have one. Okay, it's dinner time. Thank you.
I'd say that's good enough for now. I tried. <laughs> okay, so because I was flying uh, with paragliders in the past, uh, when there is uh, some more humidity in the air, they is fruitful for uh, uh, thermals. Where there is a uh, more than usual humidity in the air, there is a lot of thermals in the day. If the air is dry, the thermals are not so much. Yes, there is uh, some huge thermals, but not so... Uh, uh, more far apart. Yes. Yeah. And when the air is dry, how high do the thermals go? Uh, yeah. That, that comes into what I talked about, uh, the uh, influence of uh, the inversion height. Inversion height. So when it's, uh, I, I think of like Midwest U.S. where it's kind of humid and the inversion height's like 3,000, uh, sorry, uh, 1,000 meters. Uh -huh. And so you've got these moderate sized thermals not too far apart and then you go to California desert where the inversion height might be 4,000 Four. meters, and the thermals are you know, five, six miles apart. I'm sorry, eight or nine kilometers apart. Yeah. So, so if, if we had a lot of humidity in the air, we must expect that we will have uh, uh, more thermals in the day. The thermals might be closer together. Closer together. Yes. Uh, but the true correlation is inversion height. Yes, yes. But yeah, it's, that's uh, it. Yes, but uh, it's uh, easy to, to measure the humidity in the air. Yes. Then the, uh, the altitude of the layer. So Understood. Yeah. And well, the thing is, if it's very humid and the inversion height is very high, the result is thunderstorm. <laughs> <laughs> so. But uh, I think uh, if uh, the pilot have uh, uh, some uh, data for the humidity in the air in the morning, he must make a more risky flights, I think, <clears throat> in the beginning of the day. Interesting idea. I had not thought of it that way. <clears throat> I, I hesitate on doing single variable correlation. Mm -hmm. So I, I would look at the, uh, okay, uh, what are the clouds? Uh, <coughs> it's like we had a lot of humidity for a period this morning uh -huh. and there wasn't much air because the clouds didn't allow much heating to go on. Uh -huh. So yeah, and again, you're looking at uh, multiple things to uh, for point sure. to. For sure. uh, but yeah, that's an interesting, uh, uh, correlation that I'll have to uh, uh, pay attention to to see if it uh, uh, goes in my bag of tricks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I can I can ask. Uh, you told us, and we many of us know that uh, in the evening uh, the tree uh, trees uh, work very well, and the morning it's like the sack the energy or it's but uh, a lot of competition, you have some tree lines, what most hel helps to, to stay like in small <laughs> dynamic story uh, uh, or help to, to, to catch some bubble. Right. So my questions uh, about uh, what is probability uh, for morning flights, for example, you know we have slight wind uh, direction to trees, trees. Mm -hmm. But we know the trees are not really uh, good for morning, but yeah. like dynamic uh, uh, flying, in, it is like model versus uh, f trying some bubbles uh, what's developed on flats. Yeah, what so I, what, what, I would... uh, what is your experience? Uh, is it... Well, the first order is when it's a tree line, 
know, a row of trees like along the river and so on. Yeah. That uh, what the benefit of those trees is an obstruction to kick the air off. That is that is, uh, and they're not big enough to be a sink. It's like that's why I use the word woods rather than trees. You know, so you need to have, you know, if if this entire field of you know, 300 meters by 500 meters is full of trees, yeah, then that that area is not going to help a thermal generate. At least not until the late afternoon when that stored heat gets released. But uh, for a tree line, that, that uh, it's it's not shading the ground. Uh, uh, to a significant amount, but what it, it it's its utility is that the air that's coming to the tree line hits it and goes over, and if that air is warmed up at all, that that act of going over the trees and all of a sudden it's lighter than the air around it and boom it starts going up. Yeah, I, I think we Italy. must. Italy. Only short explanation. If this is the the wood. Your file field is here, mm. and the wind is coming from over the woods to here. You cannot uh, wait for the uh, thermal that is coming from the woods to the field. Mm. So in the morning and in the day, the woods suck the uh, radiation because the photosynthesis. Yes. So mm -hmm. they not generate the uh, hot air around. And the, in the late evening, let's say near to the sun uh, set, this some hot air is released over the the huge yeah. parts of the woods. Yeah. Uh, another. Uh, uh, another way to think of it is, I'll, I'll use uh, an experience of when I used to fly with uh, Thomas Kiesling. Uh, he's from the east coast of the United States. And what the fields that he learned how to fly in were these fields that were cut out of a forest. So you'd have like 300 meters by 300 meters of park of green grass surrounded by 80 meter trees. I mean, you know, for miles around. And uh, they also learned how to climb trees a lot. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I'd go to a contest and I'd watch him. And what he'd do is he'd launch, and the first thing he did is turn downwind, because his experience is the only thermals that he would find during the morning, early afternoon, came from the field he was standing in. So you'd have to go downwind of the field, because you go upwind over the trees, nothing. So you go downwind, and then the air that came into the field that he stood in would warm up and then hit the tree line downwind and go. So his mentality, and it's taken him a long time to finally unlearn it, was you, know, you launch and you go downwind because that's where they're most lived. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was, you know, I'd ask him, well, why didn't you go upwind where the thermal was? It's like, uh, no, I go downwind. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> And, and he, his, you know, what he had learned was a function of the type of field that he learned how to fly in. And, uh, and when you finally understand the physics of it, uh, you know, a lot of trees together and the sun's not hitting the ground and uh, what, what it's doing in the trees is making evaporation uh, or photosynthesis, but not much is going into warming the air up. And so that trees are a poor sort, poor method of allowing the sun to turn energy into heat. Whereas a, a dry field is a, a good source of allowing the sun to turn the energy into heat. It's probably the simplest way I can explain it. But uh, for a simple tree line, the air comes in and that, that single tree line is not enough to affect the uh, <coughs> Uh, how it's heating the air or not. It, it, its primary uh, source of happiness for us is how it kicks the air off. It's and the, and the, the, uh, the field we were, or what we were doing this afternoon where there just wasn't that much energy on the ground, the best thermals were 
downwind on the tree line that's perpendicular to the wind. And so when the wind changed a little bit, you go find the part of the tree line that's most perpendicular to the wind, so it's most efficient at kicking the thermals off. And in fact, my last couple of flights, I'd go down and I'm finding little bubbles in the tree line and they get too far downwind and they break up and I come back, get the next one. You could possibly argue that there was some slope aspect to it, but uh, no. <clears throat> most of it is uh, how it's kicking off the air, especially since that air is coming over a dry cotton field, so it's gotten a chance to warm up but hasn't had a chance to organize and get kicked off until it hits the tree line. But good question. Maybe we're uh, done. Let's see, it's 8.30, so uh, we're only an hour and a half till tea time. I'm now in Larissa in competition for the But now that you mentioned this downwind activity, so just because of that um, angular perspective that you mentioned, I find flying downwind much easier because it's much easier to see exactly when the model is climbing. No arguments. Uh, it's much easier to see it downwind than up, even the same distance upwind because now you've got the airplane drifting towards you that gives you the tease that I'm in air, whereas downwind it looks horrible unless it's air. Yes. <laughs> and the, the second thing about going downwind is I'm, I've been standing here and I've been feeling the air go past me, so I, I have a map of the air behind me. And the air upwind of me is just blind luck except for any flags or anything. So yeah, the air is unknown until it passes me or the flags nearby me. And uh, it's not something I do uh, I, or I try to do, but uh, you know, I, I, my brain just, you know, without my knowledge, just integrates the air passing me. And so I have a map of what's gone, what is downwind. So, <clears throat> if I don't have an obvious solution upwind, okay, I know it's downwind, so that's, that's the happy zone for me. Unless it's windy and then downwind becomes risky. <laughs> yes, one can do a lot of walking. I have a bit of experience walking yesterday. <laughs> but then again, uh, when I'm practicing, I take risks that I would not take in a contest because you need to understand where your boundaries are and you don't find out where your boundary is until you exceed it. So if, during practice I walk. Well, since we don't have a moderator here, I declare this meeting closed. <laughs>